values-based approach to culture in second language education, Contrastive Analysis of Cultures by Robert Lado. Our next question is when and how the value-based approach to culture was applied to the teaching culture in the second language classroom. The first significant attempt to apply the value-based approach to teaching culture was made by Robert Lado, the American linguist and English second language teacher, the son of Spanish immigrants to the United States. Robert Lado published his seminal book, Linguistics Across Culture, in 1957. We can consider this year as the beginning of the value term in second language education. At that time, Robert Lado was a director of English Language Institute of the Michigan State University. The mission of the institute was to promote English in Spanish-speaking countries. The mission was partly political. The concern to spread English was linked to the intention to resist the growing influence of German during and after World War II. In the 1940s and 50s, Lado and his colleagues conducted research on how best to teach English based on scientific evidence, mostly from behavioral psychology and linguistics. Their efforts resulted in a famous oral approach that would come to be known as the audiolingual method or army method. The audiolingual method apart, the name of Robert Lado, is well known in second language education in connection with contrastive analysis, on which he is rightly considered the founding father. Contrastive analysis is a systematic comparing study of a pair of languages. It identifies structural differences and similarities between languages to explain and even predict second language learners' difficulties and errors induced by their mother tongue. Comparative analysis is based on the assumption that when we are learning a new language, the existing linguistic mental representation interfere with the items of the new language system in our mind. The similarity between first and second language systems help to acquire a new concept. We call it a positive transfer. But the differences between languages can hinder the second language acquisition. In this case, a negative transfer occurs. To prevent the learner's errors and better assist with difficulties, the second language teacher should be able to conduct a contrastive analysis of learner's mother tongue or tongues and the target language. The findings resulting from such comparison can help the teacher to organize second language learning process, design teaching materials, and reflect on how to help learners. All examples we used before to illustrate how the meaning of one linguistic unit depends on its links with other elements of the same language system and varies from one language to another can exemplify the contrastive analysis procedure. Often, we associate contrastive analysis only with analyzing linguistic elements and relate it to teaching language. We forget that for Robert Lado, teaching language and teaching culture were two folders of the same process based on the same theoretical and methodological principle. The title of the first theoretical chapter of his book is The Necessity for a Systematic Comparison of Languages and Cultures. Four following chapters explain how to compare two different sound systems, grammatical structures, vocabulary systems, and writing systems, while the final chapter explains how to compare two cultures. Robert Lado believed that language education should be approached in a scientific way. Systematic comparison of first and second languages and cultures 
and transverse analysis. Was this scientific tool later suggested for efficiently teaching both language and culture? Let's see how it works. First, first, according to Lado, to be able to compare two languages and cultures, the teacher must understand how these phenomena are organized. They are both organized as semiotic, symbolic systems, structured systems of patterned behavior. Any linguistic unit and any cultural behavior or product have three interrelated dimensions, form, meaning, and distribution of forms and meaning. We can easily recognize here a linguistic terminology. Plato borrowed this terminology and approach from American distributive or structural linguistics, dominating linguistic trend in the USA at that time. Applied to the analysis of linguistic elements, form is a visible manifestation of a linguistic unit, such as word, grammar form, or phoneme. Meaning is a value or a set of values a given linguistic unit has. Distributions refer to the relationship between linguistic elements within a language system and connected stretches of speech, the rules of how the elements can be combined in the speech. Distribution rules allow to understand deeper the meanings of a given unit within a given language system. Similarly, when analyzing culture, Form means the visible manifestation of a cultural product or behavior. Meaning is a value or a set of values the given cultural behavior or product has. Distributions refer to different contextual restrictions when, how, and under which circumstances the given cultural behavior or product occurs in a real-life situation and who uses it. The analysis of distributions refines and deepens our understanding of meanings, especially related to the invisible part of the cultural iceberg, values, perspectives, and attitudes. Together, the three dimensions, form, meanings, and distributions of forms and meanings, allow to explore a cultural phenomenon from both surface and deep cultural perspectives. As an example, Leto cites eating breakfast. The form of this cultural phenomenon, behavior, and product is a set of foodstuffs and the way we cook and serve them. Distribution partners involve social cultural context in which the breakfast occurs. Time cycle, space location, actors, and positions in relation to our cultural products and practices. For example, breakfast at CAM prepared and served by the same person who eats it and including coffee and cereal with milk refer to a different complex of meanings than breakfast in bed at 11 a.m. served by a formally dressed waiter and including caviar. The primary meaning of eating breakfast is the first meal of the day providing food and drink for the body. But upon this primary meaning, a complex set of social cultural connotations come to attach. The knowledge of distribution patterns allows us to discover these connotations. The context in which we have our breakfast can tell a lot about the culture and the social group we belong to, therefore about our identity, a particular form of breakfast, the time of taking it, by whom it is prepared and served, may carry a second meaning such as a national origin, identification, a social class, class identification, a religion identification, an attitude to what is healthy and healthy, environmental, environmental issues, sustainable development, labor, moral principle, and so on. More connotations we identify, more deeper we can go into the hidden part of the cultural iceberg. 
Let's develop louder example of breakfast by examining national identity connotations associated with breakfast in French Canada. Canadian style breakfast is a region's calories meal that usually contains fried eggs, fried potatoes, fried bread, maple syrup and butter put on bread, cooked beans, meat, including fried bacon, coffee, and optionally a piece of fruit. People cook and have it at home, but often, especially on weekends or holidays, in restaurants specialized in breakfast. The national identity discourse associated with this meal can be the following. In French Canada, we regularly eat a Canadian-style breakfast because it's our tradition, even though we know that it is not the healthiest food in the world. We are proud to be French-speaking Canadian and to support the local eateries specialized in breakfast. In Canada, because of the cold climate, we need a heavy, high-calorie breakfast. A wood clutter is our cultural symbol. We work hard in Canada traditionally to respect physical labor and physical strength. It is a mark of moral strength, dignity and honesty, not hypocrisy for us. We don't identify ourselves with French people who eat, by the way, only one croissant and coffee for breakfast. We speak the same language, but we have a different identity. In a recent video published on YouTube in 2022, we can see how these complex national-based connotations of eating breakfast in Canadian culture has been used by the Canadian politician Pierre Poilievre, the official leader of the Conservative Party and the leader of the opposition. The video shows him sitting in a typical breakfast restaurant and eating his Canadian-style breakfast. He invites an invisible Justin, the current Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, to sit aside and have breakfast with him. Poilievre advances his criticism of Trudeau's economic decisions. He uses the ingredients of the typical Canadian breakfast to point out that each product on his plate, which local farmers produce, has got much more expensive because of the wrong economic policy of the government. The breakfast, which symbolizes an essential part of Canadian everyday life, the small C culture, serves as a tool to measure the prosperity of the country and the healthiness of its economy. Also, the breakfast refers to an informal woodcutter style of communication between simple people, which is also cultivated in Canadian and Quebec culture. This style of communication is associated with honesty, directness, and dignity. It is opposed to the hypocrisy of cultivated and sophisticated peoples and politicians like Trudeau, who forget interests of simple people. It is no coincidence that Poilievre chose this communication style for his day. breakfast speech. However, for a foreigner, this style can look awkward and even irritating because of its exaggerated simplicity and lack of rhetorical gloss people often expect from political leaders. We can see how the identity values associated with this simple cultural product of breakfast in Quebec allow the reference to this product to be used as an argument in political discourse. This use takes advantage of existing identity associations and reinforces them, but also it opens the door to new additional values, which are political connotations. This whole subtle ideological game is played at the level of deep culture. The three-dimension method based on forms, meanings, distributions, analysis suggested by Leto provides tools to explore deeper cultural behaviors and products by going from their surfaces aspects into deep value-related aspects. 
but it is not all. The proposed methods makes it possible to explain and predict cultural misinterpretations due to negative cultural transfer. If one compares a cultural phenomenon of one culture to the similar phenomenon of another culture, always taking into account their forms, meaning, and distributions. According to Lero, these misinterpretations are predictable like negative transfer of linguistic patterns because individuals tend to transfer the forms and meanings and the distribution of forms and meanings of their native language and culture to the foreign language and culture. When the individual of culture A trying to learn culture B observes a form in culture B in a particular distribution sport, he grasps the same complex of meaning as in his own culture. And when he is in turn engaged actively in a unit of behavior in culture B, he chooses the form which he would choose in his own culture to achieve that complex of meaning. Later distinguishes three types of typical cultural misinterpretations due to negative cultural transfer. The first type of misinterpretations is expected when the same cultural form used in similar contexts has different meaning in two cultures. The second type can be observed when the same cultural meaning occurring in similar contexts has different form in two cultures. The third kind of misinterpretations occurs when the same cultural form with similar meaning has different distribution. In other words, occurs in different contexts in two cultures. Let's see examples of each type. The first type of misinterpretation can be illustrated by bullfighting and nodding. Later cites bullfighting in Hispanic culture and its perception by American observers as an example of meaning-based cultural misinterpretation. Bullfighting has a complex meaning in Spanish culture. It is a sport, an entertainment, and a display of bravery. A typical American observer of a bullfight will see the same form and likely will not have a problem with distribution context because Americans have the experience of sport and entertainment show. However, an American will likely have some interpretational trouble. He will perceive the show as a manifestation of cruelty and unfairness. That is because in American culture and language, the concept bull and human being have specific relationship. Bull is described in the same terms as human being. Both have legs, backs, necks, hospitals and cemeteries, and both get nervous. The bull often symbolizes man's positive characteristics such as physical and moral strength. In contrast, the distinguish between man and animals, including bulls, is greater in Hispanic culture and language. The Spanish language has two different vocabulary sets to describe man and animals. Moreover, in Hispanic culture, at least at the moment when Lero wrote his book, the bull symbolized brute force as opposed to the man who has perceived as physically vulnerable but having intelligence. Therefore, in Hispanic culture, bullfighting symbolized the triumph of art over brute force. The concept of cruelty also exists in the Hispanic cultural system, but in the 1950s, it was not attached to bullfighting. Also, we can quote an example of meaning-based misinterpretation in the area of body language. In many cultures, the physical gesture Norton had is used in the context of answering a yes-no question. In some countries, such as Bulgaria, Cyprus, and Greece, nodding means yes, 
while shaking the head means no. It is usually very confusing for foreigners from countries where nodding means yes and shaking the head means no, because the familiar form in the same context has an opposite meaning. The next cultural misinterpretation due to the fact that different forms express the same meaning in the same context can be illustrated by knocking and applauding. In German-speaking cultures, knocking on the table with one's knuckles is used to express approval, appreciation, or welcome in some restricted context such as an academic presentation, lecture, or political meeting. In these cultures, applauding instead of knocking could be misunderstood as an attempt to ridicule the lecturer. While in many countries around the world, applauding is the appropriate form for the same meaning, appreciation and welcoming, in the same context, academic communication. Knocking may be interpreted as an expression of disagreement. The same meaning, the same context, but different forms. The last type of cultural misinterpretation due to different context of usage of similar form with similar meaning can be illustrated by American smiling and the usage of concepts of foreigner in the United States and Auslander in Germany. Smiling, which you analyze in the prompt, is a physical gesture which has a similar or almost similar form in many cultures around the globe and is used to express a similar primary meaning, friendliness, sympathy, welcoming. However, smiling can be interpreted differently in different cultures because of different contexts of usage. Americans use a big, excited smile with strangers. So for them, the smile is a part of basic politeness code, whereas in many other cultures, people do never smile excitedly to strangers. Therefore, this type of smile, or smiling in general, does not refer for them to the general politeness code. East Europeans often consider American to be hypocrite when they see them smiling as strangers. Asians consider Americans silly or rude because Americans show their emotions to strangers, which is not appropriate. In contrast, Americans can consider East Europeans and Asians rude or too reserved when they do not find a familiar sign of basic politeness in their faces. In all cases, people interpret the cultural behavior others through the loop of their own cultural habit. Claire Crunch, an American teacher of German and a renowned specialist in cross-cultural studies, provides an interesting example of the differences between the German concept of Ausländer as opposed to der Deutsche and its American equivalent foreigner as opposed to American. Both concepts appear similar on the surface and have the same general meaning, someone coming from a different country. However, at the deep level, each concept has different distributions and refers to a different mental construction applicable to different categories of people. Cranch began to suspect a possible difference between German and American concept when she noticed that American students from her German class were having difficulties when discussing the short story Deutsche Kastanien by Yuxin Patarkaya. This story tells us about the identity issue of a six-year-old boy born in Germany to Turkish parents. One day, his German friends refused to play with him because he was not German. His father explained to the little boy the truth, you are Turkish, my son, but you were born in Germany. The incident in the classroom forced Professor Crunch 
to do more research on the topic, which led her to the following conclusion. The difference between the German concept of Ausländer der Deutsche and the American concepts of foreigner American lies, among others, in the attitude to citizenship, which is related to regulation admitted in these respective countries. American citizenship regulation is based on you solely, birthright citizenship, which means that anyone born in the territory of the United States has the right to American citizenship. Therefore, American cons concepts of foreigner as opposed to American is less sensitive to citizenship. Citizens of other countries who live, work, and study legally in the United States are not considered foreigners even though they may speak English with an accent and belong to an ethnic minority. That is why foreign students in the United States are called international students. The concept of foreigner applies only to a very restricted group of people, including temporary visitor or illegal immigrants. In general, the term foreigner has negative connotations and should be avoided, along with the direct interrogation about somebody's origin. If Americans want to know about your cultural background and the country you come from, they will likely ask you indirectly and flatteringly, what languages, how many languages do you speak? To conclude, a child born in the United States to non-American parents is not a foreigner. Therefore, from an American perspective, the six-year boy from the German story must not be considered as non-German, but a first-generation German or true-core German. In contrast, in German culture, the distinguish between Auslander and der Deutsche is closely connected to being or not being a German citizen. A child born in Germany to non-German parents does not get German citizenship automatically, even though he speaks German and his mother tongue, there are still reasons to consider him non-German or Auslander. That is why the concept of Auslander may be applied to a larger category of people, including those born in German but not to German parents, belonging to an ethnic minority or speaking German with an accent. However, Kramsch's conclusions do not seem to correlate with finding from a recent study published by the Pew Research Center. The study explored the role of different factors such as national language, birthplace, traditions, and religions in the representation of truly citizen of a country like truly American and truly German. According to the survey results, the national language is seen as a more important requisite for German national identity than American national identity. That confirms Crunch's conclusion. However, being born in the country, practicing the national traditions and religion Christianity is things more important for being considered truly American than truly German. That's not what was suggested by the conclusion of Professor Crumbs. The discrepancies between Crumbs' explanations and data from the Pew Research Center survey encourage us to continue the further exploration of the concepts of foreigner and Auslander in contemporary American and German cultures. Perhaps the survey data reflect a change in values in German society compared to the values reflected by Yuxel Batsarkaya's story written some 40 years ago. Conclusion Leto's contrastive analysis of cultures and its influence on contemporary trends in course cultural studies and teaching culture in second language classroom.
The contrastive analysis of cultures suggested by Leto in the late 1950s was the first and groundbreaking effort to apply a value-based approach to teaching learning culture. The method helps to explore deep meanings hidden behind surface manifestations, such as cultural products and practices. That is why we can, with good reason, call this period value term in second language education. The value-based teaching was the first important step toward the subject-oriented approach, which complemented the existing object-oriented approach. Also, Leto's contrastive analysis demonstrates that the value of based approach to teaching culture has its roots in semiotics and linguistics. Leto himself borrowed his terminology and method from the American distributional or structural linguistics. Also, Leto provides us a methodology for systematic analysis of culture as a symbolic system. Cultural phenomenon is viewed as a combination of visible manifestation, form, and hidden values, meanings, and the meanings are defined by the relationship between a given cultural phenomenon and other elements of the same cultural systems in Lado parlance distributions. Also, Lado suggests analyzing cultures from a cross-cultural perspective. Identifying differences of cultural mental representation across cultures helps to understand culture-specific meanings and culture-specific worldviews. Leto's contrastive analysis of cultures and languages has been the impetus for development of specific research fields, such as contrastive cognitive semantics and cross-cultural concept studies. These research fields decode culture-specific meanings of universal concepts by contrasting different languages. They study cultural variations in concept of emotion, time, spaces, movement, basic social categories, politeness, etc. For example, Clara Crunch, who has explored different mental constructions of the concept foreigner in American and German cultures, used in her contrastive research the theoretical framework of cognitive semantics. Another important contribution of Robert Leto is the notion of cultural misinterpretations, which result from the interference negative transfer between cultural symbolic systems. Leto argued that cultural misinterpretation should be central to second language education as well linguistic errors, linguistic misinterpretation induced by the mother tongue. And finally, Robert Leto's approach provides us the answer to the question on how to teach culture in the second language classroom, how to proceed. Comparative analysis of cultures can be used as both teaching and learning methodology. And we must elaborate on this important point. Initially, linguistic and cultural contrastive analysis were recommended only as a means for developing teachers' professional skills, precisely teachers' awareness about learners' difficulties. But since 80s and 90s, contrastive analysis has turned toward the learner. It evolved in a specific teaching learning strategy known under the name of contrastive teaching or contrastive teaching and learning. In contrastive teaching, the teacher engages learners in an active systematic comparison of structural characteristics of the first and second languages and cultures. Contemporary scholars agree that contrastive teaching helps the development students, not only teachers, cross-lingual and cross-cultural awareness that support, in their turn, the neurocognitive mechanism of acquisition of new language patterns and new cultural values, because human brain acquires a new symbolic system by contrasting it 
with an existing one. Learners who have a chance to reflect on the differences between the native culture and the target culture are less prone to cultural misinterpretations. In the same way, Michael Byram, a leader expert in intercultural communication and second language education, argues that in order to develop intercultural experience and competencies, learners should act as ethnographers or as cultural anthropologists. That means that learners led by the teacher should practice how to notice and contrast intercultural differences and identify deep values behind manifestations. In the United States, the contrastive approach to teaching and learning cultures has been developed, among others, by Clara Crouch, we have already mentioned above, in Europe by the British researcher Michael Byram and French researcher Genevieve Zerata. Michael Byram's and Genevieve Zerata's work have impeached on the development of the European Language Proficiency Guidelines, our famous SURF, Common European Framework for References for Languages, and companion volume with new descriptors. After having explored the intellectual roots of the value-based approach to culture and its early application to second language education by Robert Lado, we understand better the logic behind the contemporary models of cultural dimensions for second language education and proficiency guidelines and national standards for later language education, which are based on these models such as active or serve. A second language teacher and familiar with principles of linguistics and contemporary anthropology might think that we are talking about classifications of different kinds of cultural phenomena, similar to the big C, small C culture classification or fact achievement behaviors model. There are products, there are practices, and there are perspectives. But in fact, all latest models point out dimensions of the same cultural phenomenon we should take into consideration if we want to understand the complex meaning of this phenomenon in a given culture. All these models and professional guidelines want to push us towards approaching culture as a whole semiotic system in which every element has a bilateral structure, physical manifestation and invisible aspect of meaning, bilateral. To discover invisible perspectives, we and our students should act as ethnographers, anthropologists or semioticians. We should try to consider all dimensions, product, practice and associated context, to be able to grasp values situated in the deep, invisible part of the cultural iceberg. Later's contrastive analysis of cultures and national second language education standards based on contemporary models of cultural dimension provide general directions for teaching cultural values behind manifestations in second language classrooms. However, many unanswered questions remain on how to implement these general directions in the second language classroom. The main concern are related to invisible dimensions of the cultural iceberg in the next in the next uh, in the next learning unit in the next unit unit we will explore practical advice on how to implement the value-based approach to teaching culture in the second language classroom.